This is Reaganism, a podcast dedicated to exploring where the Reagan movement lives today. I'm Roger Zak. I'm your host, director of the Ronald Reagan Institute in Washington, D.C. On this episode of Reaganism, we are joined by Juan Zarate, global co-managing partner and chief strategy officer at K2 Integrity. Juan previously served in the George W. Bush administration as deputy national security advisor. Juan Zarate, welcome to Reaganism. Thank you, Roger. Pleasure to be with you. Well, it's, uh, it's wonderful to have you here. You're currently the global co-managing partner and the chief strategy officer at K2 Integrity. You're also affiliated with a prestigious think tank in Washington, D.C., the Center for Strategic International Studies. You're known uh, really, I guess, in the policy circles for your service in the George W. Bush administration, where you led on work dealing with the intersection of counterterrorism and finance and this counter-terrorist financing. How did you get into that world of terrorist financing and the Bush administration, Juan? Thanks, Roger. It's a pleasure to be with you and, and your listeners, so I appreciate it very much. You know, I started my career as a young prosecutor in the terrorism section, the old terrorism and violent crime section at the Department of Justice. This was prior to 9-11. And so I was, um, I got to learn at the feet of the great prosecutors and investigators looking at Al-Qaeda, FARC, Hamas, Hezbollah, other terrorist actors who were, um, you know, attacking U.S. Uh, citizens and, and interests. And so I was lucky enough to shift over to the Treasury Department three weeks before 9-11. And of course, 9-11 changed the world, uh, changed the trajectory of our national security and changed the mission of the Treasury. And I was really fortunate, Roger. You know, I had at least some experience in the counterterrorism world, having come from DOJ, working with the CIA, with the FBI, and others. Uh, and the secretary and others asked me to help lead efforts on tackling terrorist financing. How to use Treasury tools, authorities, information to undermine the ability of Al Qaeda uh, to use the financial and commercial system against U.S. interests. And so. That became my mission for four years. We eventually built what is now called the Office of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence. Um, we built, I was the first assistant secretary for that function. Uh, and what we really tried to do, Roger, in that role, and I was fortunate to learn from great experts within the Treasury and elsewhere, was to think aggressively about how we unplugged America's enemies from the global financial and commercial system. And our goal and our strategy for everything we did was how do we make it harder costlier and riskier for America's enemies to raise and move money around the world. That's what the Treasury could do in the national security domain, and that's what we set out to do. I was then lucky, Roger, I, I sort of went back to my roots in the pure counterterrorism world, where I served you know, four more years uh, at the White House as the Deputy National Security Advisor for counterterrorism, where I was dealing with counterterrorism at large, but still kept a hand on the terrorist financing issues. That, that fascinating. We think probably today popularly, you know, as 9-11 as and our response more as it deals with uh, counterterrorism, the harder side, you know, the, the military side, the strikes taking out, you know, bin Laden, for example. But one, the piece that you, as you just outlined, developed in the Bush administration and these tools that the Treasury Department had and you kind of fashioned for the post 9-11 world, is that something that there was kind of elements of that you put together? And, and give us a sense of how critical it was to develop those tools to realize uh, counter-terrorist outcome uh, like, like killing bin Laden. Yeah. Well, the, the strategy came and the, the, the impetus came from President Bush, right? President Bush said, we need to use all elements of national power uh, to defend U.S. interests and to attack the terrorists who attacked us on 9-11 and to never again suffer what we suffered that day. And so that was then a challenge to everybody, uh, not just the intelligence community or the military or the FBI, but also the Treasury Department, to think aggressively about how we used our tools uh, aggressively, preventatively, and creatively uh, to attack and undermine uh, Al Qaeda in the first instance, but then others that were providing uh, material and uh, direct and indirect support to their operations. Um, I think what was a fundamental shift, because sanctions, you know, sanctions and financial measures and financial information in the national security context existed before 9 11, of course. Um, but what really changed was this notion that 
sanctions and financial measures have to be a core part of the response, right? It's not just the kinetics, it's not just the intelligence, it's not just law enforcement, but you have the treasury and financial tools to actually do grave damage to these organizations that actually do rely on the movement of money, the donations from uh, sympathetic you know, donors and organizations, the use of front companies, all these things that are part of the international uh, financial system and commercial system, we can impact. And I think that what the light that went off in everybody's mind was not only can we use these tools in a more aggressive, targeted way, but we have asymmetric advantage in the financial and commercial domain. Explain that. So asymmetric advantage, that, that suggests somehow we're more powerful and we have advantages that others do not have. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think that this is sort of well understood, right? The, the nature of our economy, the power, the size of it, the attractiveness of our capital markets, the importance of the dollar as the chief reserve currency and trading currency, all of that puts America at the center of an international financial order. Um, that brings with it lots of responsibilities. As Secretary of the Treasury Paulson used to say, uh, we have to tend to the magnificent glass house, right? We, we're sort of the, the agents and protectors of it. But at the same time, we can use power and information in that context to unplug actors from that system and to isolate rogue behavior. And in the case of the post 9-11 environment at Treasury, that started first and foremost with how do you unplug terrorist actors and their supporters, including financial institutions, from that system? How do you how do you make it just so much harder for them to operate that it makes makes them um, weaker? And strategically, can you make them make hard decisions around their budget? Can you bankrupt their operations? And can you shrink their global reach by? shrinking their ability to access capital in the financial system. And that strategy then, Roger, applies not just to Al-Qaeda or Hezbollah or Hamas, that then starts to apply to rogue regimes like North Korea, right. Iran, and others that rely on the financial and commercial system much more than people realize to access capital. Yeah, I mean, the, the language of unplug, right? Not letting them use the financial system to their benefit like any other entity, rogue regimes or terrorist networks, they need the resources and they apply those resources to carry out their, you know, malicious activity. And, and you just migrated there from, you know, the post 9-11 world, terrorist organizations to rogue regimes and state actors, um, kleptocrats and autocrats. How much more difficult or is it easier to apply, you know, the, these means these financial means uh, and tools that you have in the in the Treasury Department to quote uh, you know unplug those actors because that's you know in 2022 far more relevant uh, to what we seem to be dealing with from a national security standpoint. We'll, we'll get to Russia, Ukraine, and and all the activity there, but you know, it's the unplugging there, it's isolating them, it's the sanctions. So how much of it is a, is a deviation or a kind of continuity from the stuff you're working on uh, as you were you know p p you know putting this together after 9/11? Roger, it's a great question because I think there's a du direct continuity in many ways. And just to take a step back and address your, your fundamental question, you know, sanctions um, and the ability to prohibit transactions, ability to access capital, the ability to freeze assets, et cetera, work best, frankly, when you have actors engaged in the, in the formal and legitimate system. So it's actually harder to use these tools against terrorist actors that are, that are in the hinterlands of Afghanistan. Mm. They may not be using banks to wire money. They're using Hawaladars and other things. So in some ways, we, we started with one of the hardest case studies because we were trying to impact the, the choke points for terrorist financing in addition to the terrorist groups themselves. And that's, that's not easy to do. Um, but when you start to get to rogue regimes that may be supporting terrorist groups that may be engaged in proliferation that certainly should be and are subject to sanctions for a variety of reasons, that then becomes a target-rich environment. And I think that's what we began to realize. In fact, when I was at Treasury, we then started to look very carefully at what North Korea was doing, for example. And the assumption, Roger, was that North Korea is a hermit kingdom. 
they obviously don't have bank accounts in New York and right. who are they trading with? You know, they've been sanctioned forever. But the reality was that they were accessing capital, they were trading, they had even a, a bank in Vienna called Golden Star Bank. You know, they had sinews connected to various parts of the system. And the, the moment we started mapping that, using financial intelligence more proactively, we then began to see these choke points in these nodes to say, ah, we can squeeze where the North Koreans are accessing the formal system outside of their borders. That's fascinating. Give us an example, because I, I do want to migrate to Russia and China and kind of, you know, this kind of balance where you want to use these tools to affect behavior at the same time you incentivize actors to try to figure out ways to avoid operating within our system. So we'll, we'll get to that kind of meta challenge in a moment. But just give us a tangible example of when you put the squeeze on, when you, you know, identified that bank and, and that the North Koreans were using and made it more difficult for them to trade and have access to capital. How did they respond and, and how did it impact behavior? And did you get a positive result that complemented U.S. national security? Is there one that stands out to you? Yeah, I'll give you two examples, Roger, because they, they, they stem from sanctions regimes that had long been in existence. And most folks thought, well, there's not much more you can do to sanction a North Korean or, or an Iran. But I'll give you examples as to where it impacted. So in the case of North Korea, as we began to map their financial relationships, we saw that they were banking with certain entities. We, we saw that they were engaged uh, in money laundering. They were counterfeiting U.S. $100 bills called the, the super note because it's, it's, the quality is so good in terms of counterfeit. Um, they were proliferating. They were doing all sorts of uh, fraudulent and counterfeit activity with cigarettes, et cetera. And they were using agents and front companies and, and banks. And we identified one bank in particular called Banco Delta Asia, which was a small private bank in Macau, but was kind of an all-purpose banking hub for North Korean illicit activity. So what we did in 2005 was to identify it publicly. We named it a primary money laundering concern under a provision of the Patriot Act that had been created post 9-11 called Section 311, which gave the Secretary of the Treasury the ability to shine a light on an entity like a bank or a jurisdiction or a class of transactions to say, look, this is really problematic and, and presents a money laundering concern. Uh, what happened as a result of that, and bear in mind, Roger, that wasn't a UN action, that wasn't even a formal sanction. This was a proposed rule for mm -hmm. the U.S. financial system. That sent shockwaves in the international system because we had, we had then said, this is a pariah bank. U.S. banks can't do any business with it. You can't have a correspondent account. You can't facilitate transactions in or through it. What that led to was a a run on the bank, a closure, the Macanese authorities shut it down, a freezing of the North Korean accounts to the tune of 25 million, wasn't a ton, but it was mm -hmm. uh, significant to the North Koreans. And what that did was it sent market ripple effects that said, look, you can't just do business with the North Koreans. And interestingly, Roger, even the Chinese banks uh, began to close their doors to North Korea, despite what the Chinese Communist Party was telling them to do, because of the potential taint and the potential that U.S. actions would cut off those institutions from the U.S. financial system. So, so, so that's an interesting thread there, you know, the way it impacted the behavior of other actors, third actors. In this case, you're talking about Chinese banks. You know, maybe the assumption would be the Chinese would say, well, I don't care about the U.S. You know, the system. They can't dictate to a, you know, Chinese banks, we're a sovereign country, we, we get to decide who we bank with. Why wasn't that the response from a Chinese banking entity? Well, th this is the fascinating shift conceptually post 9-11 because the approach that we were using in the use of these sanctions and financial measures was to affect the risk calculus of the private sector. And again, if a, a bank, a company, uh, a global enterprise wants to access the US economy, wants to trade in dollars, they have to take note, if not obey US law, they, they have to take note of the way the US is considering risk and the potential liabilities that come with uh, doing risky things. And so in that environment um, and in the current environment, uh, 
you have international institutions, be they Chinese, Turkish, uh, whatever nationality, that actually have to play by global rules. And those global rules in many cases are driven by US standards and norms, which is to say, uh, no bank should be uh, banking a terrorist. No bank should be allowing proliferation finance. Counterfeiting and fraud is illegal outright. It doesn't matter what country you're in. And so if that's what you want to do, fine, you can be a scofflaw bank, but you're going to be treated as such. If you want to be a big bank, if you want to have uh, an office in New York, if you want to have correspondent accounts with JP Morgan and Citi and Bank of America, you'd better pay attention to these things. And so that's why there was this interesting split within the Chinese system at the time. Um, and to your point, what we were going after was not just isolating this one little bank. We wanted the market impact. Yeah, you're disciplining say, the whole you system. You can't do business in North Korea or with right. North Korea. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating, you know, through this one bank, you know, this, you know, freeze and, and focus, you're disciplining an entire international system because they're seeing the natural progression, which would be, well, if it's true here, it, it would happen elsewhere. Of course, you're talking about, I think, in uh, a case, 2005, you know, here we are in 2022. My sense is China doesn't want to have that repeated again. Since in the years since, they have been pushing back on those global rules, which you say for the most part were erected by and driven by uh, the United States, those standards and norms. Um, and you also said something before, Juan, which I want you to hit on. It was kind of like, if you want to trade in U.S. dollars, dot, dot, dot. Does China want to trade in U.S. dollars? Are they doing, you know, kind of transactions and, and engaging in global commerce in a way that they don't have to trade in U.S. dollars and therefore don't have to be bound by the framework you just outlined because they don't want to be squeezed by us? How has that evolved? Yeah, Roger, great, great questions. Um, I think China has a tripartite strategy here. One has been to compete aggressively and maybe beyond the rules in the current system, right? So, so challenge on, uh, on technology, the economy, but under the current rules, right? And, and to get in to international institutions and, and to, to then challenge and to have the, the yuan or the renminbi serve as a, as a major global currency in the current system. So they're working in the current system, they're getting working the, currency. In the current system. Yeah. They also then have uh, a strategy of decoupling. But to your point, Roger, I think they have understood that the dependencies on the Western financial system and commercial system brings with it vulnerabilities. And so they have very aggressively and very openly talked about decoupling, uh, nationalizing efforts. One good example of this, Roger, which played out in the Russian context too, is post-2014 when both Russia and China saw the sanctions imposed on Russia initially for Russia's invasion of Crimea. Both countries began to establish their own bank messaging system hmm. that didn't rely wholly on SWIFT, which is the uh, Brussels-based international consortium, basically the switchboard of the international financial system. Uh, they didn't want to be bound by it because the threat in 2014 was to unplug the Russian banks from that system so they could no longer message, basically could no longer be part of the international financial order. They couldn't transact, right? The ba they couldn't move funds right. around the world. Right. And of course, fast forward to 2022, Roger, the debate around de-swifting Russian banks sort of accelerated quickly. We now have seven of, of the Russian banks that aren't on SWIFT. Many others still are on. But in any event, China and Russia knew that that kind of dependency brings vulnerabilities. And so they, there's been an effort to decouple. The third thing I would say is there's an effort to replace. So it's not just play aggressively in the current domain, not just decouple, but let's replace. Let's replace with alternate sources of capital. Let's replace with alternate institutions or competitive institutions. For example, in Asia, the development bank uh, battle that's out there. And let's compete then on currency, which is why uh, the Chinese are, are moving aggressively with the digital yuan uh, to try to get adoption of the yuan and the renminbi into the international system by force or otherwise, attractiveness, uh, to try to then make 
China a more central player and, frankly, make the U.S. dollar less relevant. Fantastic. Well, that's a great roadmap for where I want to take the rest of our conversation. We'll get to the replace part in a second and, and digital currency and what China is doing there. But let's focus on the decoupling piece. Um, was China successful after 2014? That was Putin's last invasion uh, with the annexation of Crimea. Were they successful in decoupling so they wouldn't have to be as vulnerable uh, to the type of measures you and your successors developed in Treasury? How, how effective they've been to be less dependent, less bound uh, by the rules of the roads that the U.S. and, and, and the West has, had, had erected? Roger, you're asking about China or Russia China. or both? Yeah, China. I was talking China, but you can, you can hit yeah. on both. I think I think China has been more successful than Russia. Russia has obviously tried to buffer themselves against the potential for more aggressive sanctions. They've tried to build up their reserves. They've tried to buy up more gold. They've tried to nationalize more uh, supplies, et cetera, but really hard to do. And uh, their dependency on international trade, um, you know, goes both ways with in the energy sector. But but it's pretty, uh, pretty high dependency on international supply chains and the rest. With China, I think they've been more aggressive and more successful. And part of it has to do with just a bigger economy. China is a bigger economy. Uh, they have the ability not only to attract investment, not only attract joint ventures, um, but also to be demanding in terms of what they do domestically and internationally. So uh, what they demand of, of tech companies that come from the West, for example, you know, uh, access to source code, right? That that's something that Russia could never do, but China right. China's brazen in doing that. Or demands on what currency to use in particular trading relationships, for example, with the One Belt One Road, the BRI project. You know, China is able to be more demanding because of its debt diplomacy and other other uh, infrastructure investments. So so like that example, they will say, hey, we're, we're going to do this, but we're not going to do this trading U.S. dollars, which would allow them to avoid a nexus point via SWIFT or elsewhere through New York, for example. Exactly. And you've even seen this, Roger, between Russia and China, where they've agreed, at least in concept, to use ruble and renminbi versus the dollar on things like oil trades. So let, but let's pursue that for a second, because even if China wanted to decouple, I mean, in the United States, as you know well and have been a leading commentator on, there are those pushing to decouple the economies between the United States and China, particularly in areas that are relevant to national security. It's really hard because this trading relationship is robust on both sides. Our largest trading partner, China, or up there, top two, China's largest trading partner up there is the United States. When you're dealing with $500 billion plus a year in trade, can you really kind of move away the dependency on the dollar? Yeah. And and, and to, to your point, uh, China, the number two sovereign de debt holder for U.S. You know, treasuries. So, um, yeah, I think it's very hard for China to move away from the dollar. And, and part of this has to do less with their kind of political will or desires and more with respect to what the dollar means internationally, right? And in this regard, you know, there's been a lot of commentary. I even wrote about it in my book, sort of worry about sort of diminishment of the dollar and, you know, alternatives emerging even in the crypto domain, et cetera. But I think the reality is the dollar remains strong. It remains dominant. It remains attractive, in, you know, especially... Uh, in tumultuous times, and certainly in the face of state authoritarian capital systems like China, like Russia, where the currency is really beholden to the to the whims of the party, if you will, Regime. as opposed to uh, as to the rule of law, and so that that I think the the attractiveness of the dollar and where it sits globally affects China because China needs to be a global actor, wants to be a global actor. And if it's going to do that, it has to deal with dollar dominance to a certain extent. Now, they want to displace it. They want to use the yuan where they can. Uh, but it's very hard to operate internationally if you're not operating in the dollar. 
Let, let's talk about this for a second. This is one of the areas I, I really wanted you to kind of drill down on because, you know, if you're even just a passive watcher of CNBC or you know, any of these, you know, read the Financial Times or Wall, Wall Street Journal, anytime the U.S. flexes its muscle with the tools that you used and developed and your time in government have been in, kind of developed more in the years since, there's always somebody that we have to be careful. Somebody will say, careful what we do here because it will invite other countries to not want to be dependent, use the dollar, and the dollar will no longer be the reserve currency in the world. They may end up going you know, to the end in China. What I just heard you saying, but perhaps you could expand it more, is that the nature of these regimes, and particularly China's regime, is ultimately why people will not abandon the dollar. So comment on that, and then two, you know, there's a space between, for example, the dollar and the yen, the RMB, right? You also have Europe and the and and the euro. Isn't that perhaps a place where people will land in, in the future? Some kind of compromise between the United States, which sanctions all the time, and China, where well, perhaps it's not a safe bet. Take us through your thinking on that. Yeah, just a base principle for for a currency and even an economy to thrive, or at least to be the globally dominant, you know, uh, norm. It has to be based on trust, right? The markets, the actors have to trust the system will work. It's secure that there's there are rules that will be respected. Um, that you know the 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 rules of the financial system aren't subject to the whimsy of politicians, right? All of that is what makes a system strong and attractive. Um, I think China and Russia are, are weakening their stance. I think the, the level of trust is diminished. Obviously, with Russia, it's gone out the door, right? Um, but I think China is not far behind, to be honest. Mm. Um, and in that regard, I think China is in a real difficult position, both vis-a-vis -vis Russia, because they don't want the taint of what's happening with Russia or even the isolation that comes with it. Um, but they, they also need to continue to sort of try to build usage and trust in their system when they're not really doing some some of the fundamentals around that. And so I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later if you want in terms of the digital wand. But the broader point is there are these fundamental issues that really drive the question of whether or not the dollar will remain dominant, whether or not the U.S. will remain a, an attractive economy. And Sanctions will play a role in that. And I, I even wrote about the concern about using sanctions too much for them to be viewed politically as opposed to in, in, in furtherance of understood international norms like anti-corruption or anti-terrorism, right? Um, so sanctions will not be dispositive, but they will be a factor in how this plays out. And I think we've seen that, right? Post-2014 is a good example. Russia and China beginning to accelerate their ability to operate outside of Western systems. They did that in part, they did that for their own purposes, their own economic reasons, but also was spurred by the fear of sanctions. But I think the Russian episode is a great lesson, Roger, because it's not just the US that's imposing these measures. Europe has sharpened their sanctions knives here uh, in a fairly aggressive way, Asia as well, with Japan, South Korea, and to a certain extent, Singapore. Um, and so, this is now, we're, we're now witnessing uh, the post-American centric sanctions environment. And that really is a little bit frightening, I think, to rogue actors that thought that they, they could simply work around the US and the US alone. So let's go there. So you, you're, you're referencing, of course, the sanctions component that's been a, a huge piece of the U.S., but the West's response, and now perhaps even broader, you mentioned uh, Asian allies and Russia's brutal war on Ukraine and the speedy embrace of these sanctions that, just listening to you on, uh, in the past, some of these countries would have hesitated or sat on the sidelines. Now they're using these measures. Why is that so significant and it's clear to us how, how Putin respond, isolated. He, has to, he needs to go to China for support because he can't do anything with the rest of the global economy. Take us through the, the Chinese 
thinking and reaction to this as it relates to those categories you you outlined earlier you know are we going to decouple are we going to replace or do we have to work within the system kind of yeah. with this kind of multilateral response um to to russia's war on ukraine kind of where, where does that leave the world right now on on on, on the set of issues yeah well certainly the weight of the response uh, to Russia's invasion of Ukraine has been put on the shoulders of kind of the, the providing of defensive weapons and humanitarian aid and sanctions. And it's really been sanctions that have been center stage. And I think what's significant here in the context of the global system and the sanctions regime is three things. One, with respect to Europe, they have taken a leading role in trying to isolate the Russian economy and not just sort of being responsive or even following the U.S. lead, but the sheer intent of using sanctions to cripple the Russian economy. That's the words of the Europeans. That's not, you know, sanctions hawks like me in the U.S. That's what the Europeans want to do. And the Europeans themselves are driving the debate about whether or not to take it as far as banning Russian energy imports, right? And so this is a European-led debate in the context of where it affects them most directly. So that's significant. Two, I think we've entered the realm of financial warfare. As I said in my book, Treasury's yeah. War, uh, we are trending in that way. And I think the Europeans finally have recognized that, that this isn't just, um, sanctions aren't just an element of diplomacy or they're not just a thing to do when you don't have anything else to do to punish somebody. This is actually a part of influencing in the context of conflict. And so, so that's a lesson a we point learned point. right after 9-11, Roger. That was, so, that was what we learned right away. Meaning you could take out a terrorist network through kinetic means, as you mentioned before, you know, a, a special operations strike force, or you can use a sanction to do it. And what you're saying right now, what we're witnessing in Europe and the way Europe's responded to Russia's brutality and, and, and war on Ukraine is they're actually using it as a as a kind of another means of of impacting uh, the battlefield. Absolutely, it- and and I, that's absolutely right. And I, part of this is the function of how grotesque and horrific Russian activity has been. Obviously, with revelations of huge human rights abuses, maybe war crimes, right? And the 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 desire for Europe and NATO not to use direct military force or to intervene, well, you're sort of left with this sort of moral question of what do you do? And sanctions then become a major element of that moral question, if not political, and uh, and and question about how do you wage warfare in the 21st century? Well, yeah, I want to pull the thread on that. We're going to, I want to get to cryptocurrencies and digital currencies as we, as we wrap up. But you know, I think there's a view that, all right, the Europeans, they don't want to risk the lives of their citizens. They don't want to get in direct armed conflict with Russia. That's been the posture of the Biden administration, certainly not to have U.S. on Russia direct military conflict. But what I hear you saying, and maybe you could just pull the thread and and give us a, a tangible case for this, is that some of these sanctions actually are a form of armed conflict, you know, like warfare in the sense that it is having a material impact now on the battlefield. I think the assumption people have is that, oh, you know, this might impact the Russian economy and 60 days, 90 days, 100 days a year, they may feel it. And of course, the Chinese can always bail them out. Sounds to me like you're saying something different. Yes, yes and no, because I think it's too much to ask of the sanctions that they kind of stop the war or turn back the tanks, right? But sanctions as applied in a, in a maximalist way, and, and you know, I would say we're close to a maximalist approach, not, not yet there, um, affects supply chains, affects access to capital. And so if this is going to drag on, as, as most military experts are now saying, the, the sanctions themselves actually begin to affect the ability of Russia to operate uh, as an economy for its war efforts, um, and it, it will force the Russians to make hard decisions about the use of their resources. Again, back to our strategy in 2001, I wanted to make it harder for mm. Al-Qaeda to pay Pakistani scientists for access to nuclear material 
or to pay the families of their suicide bombers. I wanted them to make that choice by constricting their ability to access capital. So at a certain point here soon, Russia is going to have to start making some hard strategic decisions about how it applies its resources and what it does. That will impact its ability to operate in, in a wartime, and it will, if not deter, it will impact their ability to, to do other nefarious things. So that it could impact their behavior, and sooner rather than later is what I'm saying. It may not be you know, the next 30 days, but as we march on from weeks to months— it's going to be harder for them to pursue the course they're on without really feeling the bite of these sanctions. These, what I hear you these saying. will bite. They will, they will bite more than people realize. The Russian economy is going to be weaker, more isolated. The ruble, despite the propping up that we've seen that's, that's kept the value uh, up at, at pre-war levels, that will, um, that will be weaker. Uh, and, you know, Russia is going to be isolated and that's going to make it just harder for them to operate broadly, whether it's, the war in Ukraine, provocations against the Baltics, you know, investment in their nuclear program, like whatever they have to do, they are going to be weaker and are going to have to make strategic choices. That's the, the beauty uh, and also the frustration of sanctions because it's not an immediate silver bullet, but it has real strategic impact on the target if applied properly. Fascinating. Let's bring in another very important development in the you know, kind of decade plus since you were in government. Uh, that you're expert in and, and is a variable that is highly relevant to national security, although it may not be intuitive. And I'm referring to cryptocurrencies and digital currencies. Generally, I think the common listeners think about cryptocurrencies, they think about Elon Musk and, you know, <laughs> people trading it on Reddit, whatever. Why are you, you know, this policy expert, lawyer, you know, the intersection between finance and terrorism and rogue regimes focused on cryptocurrencies, Juan Zarate. <laughs> because crypto early on, when I, when I started looking at this in the sort of the early days of Bitcoin, struck me as an alternate financial system and an alternate way of accessing value and transferring value. And of course, my world for many years was how do you restrict the ability of bad guys to get access to capital? Um, and so the early days of crypto, it's really a question of how do you make sure that this ecosystem, this technology, the implements of it, develop in a way that are advantageous to US interests and don't serve as a safe haven or a dark corner of the universe for the bad guys. To but break that capital. down, just for those not familiar with cryptocurrency, you know. How is this something that would help a bad guy either finance a rogue regime or, you know, avoid uh, kind of being connected to uh, the U.S. or global, uh, you know, financial sector? What, what is it about crypto that makes it different than gold or silver? Yeah, gr great question. Three things about it. One, um, this is a technology that's about distribution of uh, the, the value and the val validation of the financial system. So think about this like the internet, but kind of the financial version of the internet. And that's not controlled by any one bank. It's not controlled by any one uh, regulator or central bank. This is controlled by the technology um, and the distributed nature of it. So that's the first thing, which is it's not controlled by anything, um, at least currently. Well, it's something different if you talk about central bank digital currencies, but that's one thing. Second, um, it is intended to be distributed and democratized. That is to say, this is a tool or technology that is intended, Roger, for, for you and me to interact without having to have a middleman, without having a bank in the middle or a central bank or some other a uh, clearinghouse or a money service business like a Western Union, right? It's the ability for us to transact one-on-one, -on -one, which is incredibly efficient, potentially. Huge advantages for financial inclusion, but obviously gives bad guys the ability to operate in ways that are outside the bounds of what we've normally created as the, as the formal financial system. The third part is, in theory, these coins, the tokens, and the technology provide for more anonymity, or at least in theory, 
Now, the reality is if you have something like Bitcoin or Ethereum, these are transactions that are, that are tracked and marked forever on an open ledger system. So you and I can go look to see you know, how much has Elon Musk traded in Bitcoin and to where did he send it, et cetera. So in some ways, it's even more transparent than the formal financial system where you would never see what Elon Musk is doing with a wire transfer from his bank account in Bank X to Bank Y, right? So, right. Um, but there are dark corners of this universe. There are privacy coins. There are those that are trying to create dark uh, networks. DOJ just took down a network called Hydra. It sounds like a, a you know, Marvel a, a villain out of Marvel, exactly. <laughs> so, um, so the reality is, bad guys can use this to try to interact and gain capital. And we know that regimes like North Korea, back to our early point, have perfected the art of cyber heists and some of these crypto um, heists in order to access capital that they can't otherwise. So that's why I was originally very interested. Mm. And I also knew that this had the potential to challenge the way that we engage in financial commercial relations and frankly, the role of the US system and the dollar. So I wrote about this in my book many years ago saying, look, we've got to watch this carefully. But what's interesting here, Roger, and you hosted a great panel uh, the other day for, for the Reagan Institute about this. I think everyone's realizing this is its own financial system that has its own attributes, its own risks, but also huge opportunities to reinforce the strength and centrality of the dollar and the U.S. system. So that's not intuitive to people. Explain that. Why would the system that operates outside of government, that there's no middleman, which, of course, is the place where government inserted itself to figure out who was doing what to who, and makes it, you know, kind of has this anonymity element to it, how would that ultimately be something that would accrue to the benefit of our country economically and national security? Uh, th three reasons, and th th these are kind of simple ways of thinking about it. One is we've crossed the Rubicon of legitimacy. So this is an economy that's already out there. It's flourishing, right? So think of this as an, another asset class, another payment system out there. So it's out there. It's in the wild. Publicly traded companies are publicly traded companies buying Bitcoin. Yeah, I'm an advisor to Coinbase. You know, they the direct listing last year, almost a year ago to, to the date. So the you know. The system's out there, and there's trading happening, innovation happening, uh, transactions, all sorts of innovations around NFTs and smart contracts. So, in in a way, you know, we want to compete in that environment. We want that that innovation happening here because it's going to happen anyway. So that's one thing. Two, it's a domain where the dollar can be reinforced, and that's counterintuitive because you'd say, well, this cryptocurrency or that cryptocurrency will displace the dollar. But the reality is these coins or these crypto tokens, whatever you want to call them, um, rely still on trust if they're going to be used, if they're going to be adopted. And the most popular stable coins, those coins that are backed by fiat currency, are those that are backed by the U.S. dollar. So if if this Do that system one more time. So the ones that, are, you know, what stabilizes what I just heard you say, what stabilizes cryptocurrency Let's call it Bitcoin be example, correct? Well, Bitcoin is not a stable coin, so it's a slightly different okay. type. It is, is, is when they're backed by? That, that's one dollars. of the values here, yeah. So the, the markets, the investors, financial institutions are looking for uh, ways of using this technology. One of the ways is to use stable coins, Got which it. are backed by a fiat currency or an equivalent. Uh, let's say securities or, or, or treasuries, um, and the ones that that are gaining most purchase are the ones that are dollar backed. And in fact, if you look at how Bitcoin is is tagged and and valued, you look at all these. It's based on the dollar, um, and frankly, then the ability to access the dollar. And the third reason this is important, mm. Roger, is um, crypto like the dollar is an outlet and a safe harbor for those that are worried about their home government's currency and their ability to retain value. And so um, this is not only a hedge against devaluation and currencies that are worthless, but it's also a hedge against authoritarian regimes that want to control the economy and 
uh, business and commercial interactions for their citizens. So in a, in a sort of a maximalist way, and I think Ronald Reagan would appreciate this more than anybody, you know, this is a, this is a completely democratizing technology yeah. that really threatens the state authoritarian system that want to control everything. This is why China has banned Bitcoin. This is why what they want to do is issue their own digital yuan, one that the central bank controls, so that they can then know who's transacting with whom and combine that with other data. That's a very different, that's the flip side of this versus a much more open, so, distributed, democratized. That's model. the Chinese trying to control the system because they see that the possibility of capital of Chinese, you know, people in China to go into Bitcoin, avoiding, you know, the, the reach of the Chinese Communist Party, enter, if I understand you correctly, you know, the Chinese-backed digital uh, you know, currency. Exactly. And Roger, we've seen glimmers of how this plays out in, in a positive way for our national security. We've gotten aid and assistance into Venezuelan people via the use of crypto. You've seen this with Ukrainian support and donations it's come in crypto. Um, it, it doesn't rely on a central authority. It doesn't rely on what may be a devalued currency. It doesn't rely on what is likely a corrupt system, right? And you can begin to imagine, even in places like Afghanistan, other places where you certainly don't want to send money into the hands of bad actors, this as a democratized way of getting value in. Now, it's all sorts of challenges with that, um, but it's really a fascinating way of thinking about the technology and one that begins to challenge in favor of the U.S. as opposed to simply being a risk. Fascinating. Uh, Juan Zarate, this, this is a great discussion. Uh, few, if anyone, can go from counterterrorism, 9-11, all the way to cryptocurrency. Uh, you did it, uh, <laughs> and it appears with ease. Uh, let's go to our lightning round. Uh, again, thank you so much for being here. Here's where we ask our guests to share with us either their favorite book on President Reagan, favorite uh, speech by President Reagan, or, or a quote from President Reagan. What comes to mind for you, Juan Zarate? Well, I, I, Roger, I think it's three things. And if I can just say, you know, I grew up uh, with Ronald Reagan as kind of the lodestar of, of great American presidents uh, with moral clarity and with a clear role for the United States around the world. I, I was born into a home. Um, my mom came from Cuba. She, she left you know, communist Castro regime. My father came from Mexico seeking greater opportunity. Um, and so in our home, we revered Reagan for what he represented and the shining light on the hill uh, that he knew America was and that my family knew was by experience. And so um, the shining light on the hill uh, reference to America is what sticks with me most because that's what America's always been to me, that's what it's always meant to my family. And it's the reality of the American dream, as represented by Reagan, as represented by my parents, that I value most. Juan Zarate, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, Roger. Great being with you. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Reaganism. New episodes premiere weekly every Monday on YouTube and all podcast streaming platforms. If you like this episode, be sure to let us know and share with a friend.